Thank you, Jason, for taking the time to uh, be with me today. Absolutely. It's really nice to meet you, finally, <laughs> after like uh, three years. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> yeah, could you give me a little overview of your career? Sure. Uh, I started animation, uh, my learning, I started like back in 1990, uh, back in Dublin, Ireland. And then after I graduated, I was more of a 2D animator and I wanted to work in 2D feature films and I just happened to know some ex bluth animators by the name of uh, Greg Turnin and Paul Bulger who gave me my first break on a German production for a trick company and the movie was called Philly Day and we actually actually had to animate uh, cats being cats you know um, and it was the first time that I've ever tried to animate somebody else's characters um, I was always very comfortable with animating my own characters because I knew what they looked like from every angle. But when I had to animate somebody else's designs and I didn't know what they looked like from every angle, it was a challenge. It was a really good challenge. And I learned a lot, you know. So it was one of those movies that um, I, it taught me how to become fast because on that production we were paid by the approved foot. So like any wow. shot that you got approved... Uh, you got paid for if you didn't get your shot approved you didn't get paid so in order to pay your rent you had to get your shots approved so you have to think very quickly on your feet and uh, you could be getting a uh, shot with 22 cats and you have to do all the cats and you're still the same footage as if it was one character wow that's crazy <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun it was a really good learning experience and then we went to work in london on this really uh it was cutting edge for me like it was a computer game and I was looking at like, wow, computer animation. I, I played computer games like Commodore 64 way back when, in the 80s, but I didn't know what computer game animation was. And Eamon Butler brought me over to London. He showed me how the software actually worked. And it was actually software built by this one guy. Uh, it was a homemade software and it was phenomenal. I mean, I think even to this day, it was, I mean, very early days in, in graphics style. I mean, they were very simple ellipsoid type characters, but humanistic, but you could literally time as your animation is playing back. So you could see that something's like not quite working time-wise. There was no frames. It was just a timeline of, of the action. So if the, if the action that you were trying to do, say it was a backflip or something like that, and it felt too fast, well, you just grab the timeline and make it longer, and then the, it would slow down. And then you could go, okay, I'm on this key, uh, between this key and this key, I could say, oh man, that's too quick. I could just stretch it and bring it near closer to the end and it would start to slow down real time. So it's playing back and you go stretch and it's starting to slow down and I go, no, a little bit closer. Oh, that feels pretty good. And it was just amazing software. Now the math wasn't perfect. It was great for doing broad actions like fighting, uh, like doing somersaults or running and jumping. But when you had to do something kind of a little bit more subtle where you're trying to do some a little bit of acting, you know, where it's like a character's kind of looking around or something like that, it would start to kind of jitter, like on the in-between, so you could tell like it was, it was having a hard time trying to find a way of solving very, very close in-betweens. Yeah. So that was cool. But right after London, I, I got the job at uh, Disney to work on Fantasia 2000. And that was like the first real feature film using CG. And it was more, um, they wanted to hire 2D animators or 2D experience um, to learn how to use the computer. But uh, it was uh, approached in a very 2D way because we were actually doing all the animation in CG on twos, unless there was a camera move and then we would, would switch to ones. Um, okay. But it, was, it felt very 2D because it was rendered sort of like a cartoon, you know, so they wanted to feel like 2D animation. So it was really, I mean, that was like one of the most rewarding projects because it was where we're starting to build these tools that allows us to get sort of like our 2D quality into CG. For me, it was almost like a way easier way of animating than 2D was for me because I didn't have to flip and tell before I actually shot it um, if it was going to work real time. Like you, you're flipping paper and you're drawing and you're, you're working out your spacing and you're trying to work it out and, and, and it feels really good and you pick it up and you start rolling it and you kind of go, yeah, that animation is going to work okay. And then you shoot it and then you're like, oh, that didn't work the way I thought it was going to work and then you start scrambling and start retiming it like in the in the timing chart on the computer sort of down shooter software and you'd be like oh man how am I going to make this work and and it's all drawing so you kind of go well 
uh, if the spacing isn't quite right, then I have to kind of rip off the peg and start shifting it like so that I'm recreating the spacing. But in CG, all you have to do is like grab the control and move it and put it where you want it, you know? Yeah. So for me, it was like a, a, a no brainer. Uh, but I did find that like the people um, that were really good at 2D animation, that found drawing super easy and were able to, they were like masters of the charts. They, they only had to do like, like a couple of drawings for every second of, of animation. I found they had a little bit of a harder time because they normally would rely on an assistant to do like maybe some of the breakdowns or some of the in-betweens or some of the favorite timings and amazing assistants, you know, and they would make beautiful animation out of it. But I found they had a harder time seeing their timing in CG. I've uh, realized that uh, you've still retain a lot of your 2D techniques in your workflow. Could yeah. you explain your yeah, workflow? Yeah, I mean, I like to go in with a plan. Um, so any shot that I'm going to do, I like to be able to think it out on, on paper or like in the computer program. Like the program I use is Digicel Flipbook and it's a 2D software that has all the traditional timing charts that are very familiar to me. So I'm able to draw it out very roughly. I'm not drawing it clean at all, but still understand what's going on compositionally, arc-wise, entertaining, acting-wise, like expression-wise. But if I can get away with a stick figure with just like two dots for the eyes and just a circle around there just to tell eye direction, that would be perfect for me because all I'm trying to do is figure out what my plan is for the actual shot. And then what I'll actually do is like, I'll go in, after doing the 2D pass, I'll see the plan and I've already got it in my head what I have in my imagination, what I really want the, the shot to look like. This is just like a blueprint almost. So now it's all in my head, it's like informed, right? I'm informed now of what I want the shot to look like. So then I'll go ahead with that information and shoot live action reference for it. If it's something very, very subtle, something very sophisticated, something that's very, very uh, naturalistic, if you will. Um, and I'll shoot some live action reference with all that 2D blueprint stuff in my head. And then I can go ahead and take the reference and break that down into keys and breakdowns and bring that into Maya on an image plane. And then I've got something super natural that I can go in and go, okay, there's my keys. I'll hit those ones first. And then I'll go back in and hit the breakdowns. And I'll go back in and break it down even more. And then I'd, I'd eventually, once I've sucked all the information out of the live action reference, I put it to the side. And then I want to make it better than life. I want to just push it for the character, uh, push the poses even more, push the expressions even more, just so it really sings when it plays back. And what keeps you inspired as an artist? Great question. I mean, and sometimes you'll start working on feature films that don't necessarily push you forward artistically as an animator or even as a person, you know. And I always want to keep myself creatively fulfilled. So I'll start designing shots that I'm not getting on feature films, that I'm not getting a chance to do. Like, you know, I've been doing a lot of broad stuff. I'm kind of doing a lot of mechanics animation, like in feature films. And I kind of get, you can kind of get pigeonholed as that type of animator. Oh, that guy can do this. That guy can do that. You know, and then they, they give like the subtle emotional acting to the people that gravitate towards that stuff. But I, I want to get a chance to do some of that as well. So even when you're a professional animator, I mean, right now I've got like 21 years of experience, but I still want to push myself forward, like still grow as an animator. I mean, we're always learning, you know. Every time I, I start a workshop, I'll say, you know, who here like is, uh, you know, still learning animation? And a lot of people put their hands up. I'm like, thank God, you know, because if they didn't put their hands up, I'm like, well, you've given up then. You, once you stop learning, you might as well just pack it in because you're still just pulling from a bag of tricks then and you're not growing as an animator or, or as an artist you know so you always want to find things that can push your work forward as an animator you know so I will choose things that push me out of my comfort zone so like really really emotional sincere subtle animation is something that I find very difficult to do so I'll embrace that embrace that like and own up to it and say I need to work on that, you know, and then start doing shots in your own time because this, this is a job for life. It's not a job that you can just go, oh, yeah, I'll just do my nine to six and go home and, and just leave it. You're going to be thinking about it all the time because it is something that you've got to be passionate about. And it's a job that I would do for nothing, you know, but it's like one of these things that I want to be really great. I want to be a great animator and I still don't feel, I feel like I'm still scratching the surface on my potential as an animator. 
And sometimes I'll see animators who have been in the business for maybe three or four years, and I don't see them doing or getting better. And I feel like they're in a rut. And it's like you've got to like do your own stuff. Like even if they're just short tests, like even if it's just forty eight frames of something really really subtle that helps you grow as an animator, you're just going to see the benefits tenfold when you hit your your actual workstation. And uh, in a few words, what is animation for you? I mean, for me, animation is poses, graphic image, and flow. What's animation for you? Animation for me is just breathing life into characters, like bringing them to life, like creating history through your animation. It's like you're creating something from nothing. Um, I mean, to me, animation is all spacing. It's all spacing. Everything that moves on the screen is spacing. And then how fast those poses appear on the screen is your timing. And all, everything else, like overlapping action, anticipations, it's all spacing. It's all describing something that's moving on the screen. Like how quickly or how slow it is, is your timing. But like a lot of your timing can actually come from your spacing. So to me, animation is all about spacing. You know, and then like how fast it runs on the screen is your timing. Hmm. What was the greatest obstacle in your career? Oh, that's a really good question. Wow. That's a really good question. I mean, I, I would say that the greatest obstacle is trying to get out of Ireland and into the States. Um, because um, you, you'll often find that you'll be in a vicious circle, like, well, they may not be able to get you, they feel that you're very talented and they will give you the job, but you're not in the country. And to get like a visa, you know, like it's a really difficult thing for a company to say, oh, well, we think you're better than anybody here in the States. We want to sponsor you, like to get that visa. And it's a really difficult thing to prove, and especially these days where there's so much competition. Um, but I mean, it's just a way that like, you have to have spectacular animation on your reel to prove that you are better than anybody else that's in that neighborhood, that they have to be able to bring you in. On the contrary, what is your most proudest moment, your greatest victory? Wow, you know what? I, mean, I looking back. I, I almost like don't even like looking back, you know, because it's one of those things like you feel like you're getting better every shot that you do. So, I mean, I could tell I could say like some of my favorite shots, uh, one, you know, that just comes to mind is one that I did um, on the Croods where the, the name was coming down, the Croods, and it was like the breakfast formation. And I got to work with all of the supervisors on that show to actually like, and even James Baxter, film live action reference for me, uh, Lena, you know, film live action reference for the two female characters. And it was great because I got to work collaboration wise with all the leads and we created like this awesome shot, you know, and it was really, really cool. Sean Sexton was one of those guys that, and he was a supervisor on the show that he, he really pays attention to spacing and he's like a, a breath of fresh air as far as fresh eyes goes because you can kind of look at a shot and see the spacing errors where and every person, like no matter how much experience you have, you're all going to be blind to your own work. And you need like those fresh eyes to kind of go, yeah, that pose isn't quite reading or that spacing pop, did you see that? And I was like, no. And then he points it out and you're like, wow, wow, it's so obvious. Like when somebody points it out to you, but because we're so close to our work, we're creating this from nothing. Like it's just from a static model, a T-pose. Yeah. We're creating this shot, you know? So like we find it hard to kind of get into... Uh, like to, to take a step back you know and be able to kind of go oh wow yeah that spacing is kind of a bit weird and sometimes you, you need to kind of take a fresh eye and sometimes we'll like either flip the, the shot so it's backwards and uh, not playing backwards but like going if the characters are left to right you know we flip it horizontally so it's like so that they're opposite to each other and you start to see like weird balance issues and you can kind of go oh wow and anything you can do to get a fresh eye in some people just kind of look at it through a mirror you know, yeah. and it, it was sort of it was something that we used to do in two D. We'd draw like our poses, and it would hold up to a light, and then you kind of go, "Oh wow, look at that weird like, like the eyes aren't quite sitting on the head, like the perspective isn't quite right, or they're completely off balance." Just know? trying to trick your brain, basically. Exactly, yeah. like just to see it like with fresh eyes. Sometimes I'll do a shot in the morning, and I'll go to lunch, and I'll come back in and hit play, and like, "Whoa, what the hell was I thinking?" You know, I was thinking, oh, this is going to be a great shot, you know, and I come back after lunch, I'm like, did somebody just mess with my shot? Like, I mean, just, you know, it, it, it's bizarre, like, but fresh eyes is the best thing they can do. So my one advice would be, like, don't sit down and animate constantly for eight hours. 
like take breaks, you know, take little breaks, jump up, make a cup of coffee, take a little break and then come back with like just five, 10 minutes even, you know, come back with fresh eyes because it really will it'll help like kind of solidify your shots a little bit faster. Uh, you've been evolving as a supervising animator and mm -hmm. now an animation director at Cinecide. That's right. Congratulations, yeah. by the way. Thank you. That's Thank really you. nice. What, what, were you, what is your mandate? As a supervising animator, my, my criteria is, is a little bit different to some supervisors. Um, I get a team of animators, especially in DreamWorks, I would have a, like, maybe a team of eight or nine animators. And I want to make sure that each one of those animators grows as an animator. So I make sure that each one of them gets really juicy shots and each one of them gets really crappy shots, you know, because like in a sequence, there are going to be those shots that like, you kind of go, oh man, I, I, it's, it's a close up of hands or a close up of feet, you know, and like somebody's got to do them, you know. So I want to make sure that everybody gets evenly distributed, like with some great stuff so that they have a really nice reel and, and a part of the movie that they feel like they've contributed to, you know. Um, so I really like doing that. I really like making, not taking like their choices and making them mine, but making sure that their ideas get seen by the director uh, first and foremost, you know. On shows I have worked in the past, like it, it would stop with a supervisor and like, like it would be like a wall, like you would never be able to get to see the director to show that pass. And then sometimes that backfires on the supervisors. Like sometimes they will actually tell you to do something different than you actually blocked out and it doesn't get to the director and the director sees what the supervisor wanted and it doesn't work. And then they either have two choices, they can let the animator burn and just say, well, I told him you know, to do it this way and he didn't do it. Or they can you know, own up to him and say, well, sorry, uh, he had it that way and I decided to do it this way. So I never want to be that block. I want to be able to show their initial gut reaction animation, acting to the director. And then if the director says, well, this is cool, but I want it to go in a different direction, then I make sure that they're steered in that direction. Yeah. So, so in other words, I don't like the animators to feel like they're just being my wrist. You know, I don't want to just say, do it this way or this is the highway. Because then they're not growing as an animator and they'll stop making acting choices. They'll stop making choices on anything. And they'll just be uh, a robot that yeah. you basically give information to and they'll do the information. They stop pushing the envelope and they stay in the comfort zone. They stay in a comfort zone, but they'll actually regress. They'll actually won't even stay in a comfort zone. They'll actually go backwards because they'll be afraid to make any choices. Um, like where they were, they're a great animator and you trust that they're a great animator, otherwise they wouldn't be there. And you know, you gotta go, okay, cool. I, I trust you as an animator, go with your gut. How do you feel like this character? And we can talk about and ask and shoot live action reference and we can help each other. But I want them to make the, the decisions because then they have ownership over it and they'll feel more enthusiastic about really polishing it and going, I'm really proud of that shot. I really brought that from nothing all the way up to there. And I might be just a pair of fresh eyes. I might say, yeah, this part, like it's not quite reading or the director specifically said he didn't want it to go in that direction. So maybe we have to kind of like change this part in the middle, but keep like your beginning and end. So it still feels like they're shot, but like with the, the director's twist. And uh, you're currently you're recruiting to build your team. That's right. What do you look for? People that can animate. You just have to be able to prove to me that you can animate and you're comfortable moving characters around believably in a 3D space. And making sure that they're the acting choices feel sincere. I mean, sincerity is a really difficult thing to do. It's super hard because a lot of students tend to put in a lot of actions, a lot of gestures, and um, because it's cool motion, but it's not maybe the not the right acting choice for a sincere, subtle performance. I'll be constantly talking to an animator saying, well, if I'm talking to you and I'm doing this, you know, you're going, what the heck is he doing with that hand? Like, it's so distracting. So. Initially, what I would try to do, like that's advice I give to any students, like when you're doing a subtle acting shot that's got some sincere emotion to it, try not to do any hand gestures at all. Like if you want some business to do, maybe like you know touching cloth or something, but but keep it sort of like in the zone so it's not distracting f away from your actual facial performance. Because any sort of motion that's sort of like down here on the bottom of the screen or off to the side that's away from like the facial and the eyes that's going to distract away from the audience and it's going to feel insincere. 
so I look for students that have sincere, believable acting choices and also being able to do broad physical actions, natural and cartoony, you know, because we don't really know what the style is yet. You know, it could be cartoony, or it could be naturalistic, but we want to be able to have people that are well-rounded so they can actually kind of do a broad range of animation styles. We're currently experiencing, a, I, I wouldn't say a crisis, but a, a low in the industry with a few animation, a feature film that bomb at the box office, even yeah. though they were big budget films. Right. Uh, do you think there's something lacking or there's an issue in the way we do films? I, I You know what, it's, it's a really hard thing because if everybody knew how to make a successful film, then every single film would be successful. And, you know, a lot of movies that people kind of put all their eggs in one basket, really believing in themselves that's a fantastic movie, and it probably is a fantastic movie, it may be the choice of colors, uh, maybe the trailer, it might be the choice of design, the characters, you know, that maybe some people may not find appealing. Um, and appeal is such a subjective thing. I mean, I've went to movies that I really loved. I mean, it was always a phenomenal movie. Then you go, yeah, I didn't really like it. That was boring. I fell asleep. I'm like, wow, that's so amazing. Like, I mean, that like some people could love something and some people could hate it. So it's it's a very very subjective thing. Um, I think, you know, people like to be brought on a journey. You know, like they like to be able to believe in the characters. The characters have got to be appealing. You know, otherwise, what's the point in, in looking at them? Um, I do find the, the very hyper-realistic animation movies, um, not, not talking like Transformers or any sort of like uh, effects kind of movies. I think they're all phenomenal and that's what people are paying for. But like if you're trying to do an animated movie that's meant for kids but it's hyper-real, I think that might be kind of one of those things that kind of falls a little bit short. Um, because they're expecting something fun and funny and being able to laugh at it and have all those kind of really cute appealing characters in there to entertain them you know but if it's super subtle and sincere and everything but it's meant for very very young kids they might be bored to death you know um, and, and something like that we learned in Disney a long time ago it's just like kids love slapstick they just love it you know any sort of you know, getting hit over the head, bonk, you know, somebody falls over, slips on a banana skin. They just love that stuff. They eat it up. But if it's like really, really touchy subject, like um, like in The Incredibles, like when they were talking about divorce, it's kind of a heavy subject. Yeah, it might just go right over kids' heads. And I find that a lot of kids don't really like that movie. But like as teenagers and as animators, I think it's the best movie that was ever made, you know, live action or animated movie I thought it was phenomenally shot and the acting was, was it's phenomenal you know it's still one of my favourite movies and uh, but like a young kids like my son he's 10 uh, doesn't care to watch it you know because I, I think he he doesn't quite get what they're talking about like but when it's the superhero stuff and they're fighting and all that great you know so I think it's a choice of movie maybe but again, it's it's very subjective. Try I don't to know. target the audience that you want exactly, to exactly. reach for. And what is next for you? What's next for me? Yeah. Well, I'm going to be an animation director. It seems like the next logical step for me as an animator. I've been an animator, a supervising animator, an animation supervisor. And now it feels like the next logical step. And I'm really looking forward to it because then I get to motivate my crew. You know, I want them to have, I mean, a lot of this will be maybe their first feature film. And I want them to be really comfortable in making any acting choice that they want to make. And then I'll help them make that be the best movie that they've ever worked on. But does it mean that you won't animate? I think it'll depend on how much uh, on hands-on training or hands-on sort of uh, directing that I have to actually do. You know, So if, if I feel like my crew is just like blazing through the animation, I'll be like, Hey, I want some of these shots, and I might pick out you know three or four shots that I can I can do like sort of like in my own time you know after work, um, but I want to be able to be there to make sure that their animation sings on the screen. Perfect. It was really nice to talk with you. Cool. Thank you. No worries. Thank you.